I am Sean Webb, and this is your superior self. Hi, this is Rock Goddess, and I am rolling with your superior self. Hi, this is Dave Meltzer, and this is your superior self. Hi, this is Zach Poitra, and this is your superior self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is your superior self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is your superior self. What is up, Superior Nation? Welcome back. Happy New Year 2021. It's going to be the best year yet. I am extremely excited to air this episode because it, it, it is a pretty powerful conversation with my man, Thomas Campbell. I mean, we're going to be breaking belief systems and just talking about some crazy theories. Uh, he is the author of the book, My Big Toe, and you guys are probably wondering why I would bring somebody on with a big toe book, but the toe is an acronym for theory of everything. My big theory of everything essentially is the title of this book. Um, it's about awakening and discovery and basically challenge you, challenges you to collect data for yourself about ideas or ideas or like assumptions about spirituality consciousness this reality plane that we live in and what you know he's a physicist so it's like you know he's gonna come at you with some data you know he's gonna come at you with some theories and some hypotheses that is gonna blow your mind and you're probably gonna be like no that doesn't make sense for me but a lot of that you think about it a lot of that negative like negative feeling you feel right away when you hear somebody say that we live in this virtual reality like experience is like it's like no that's not it that's not it at all but you think about the programming programming that we've had all of our lives like you want to believe that you know there was an adam and eve and everything was built you know in seven days and that's the way it is but i think you have to have an open mind to to for everything you have to be like an intellectual skeptic you have to, I mean, spirituality is a very subjective game. Like you can't, I mean, intelligence is only going to get you so far. If you think about the, uh, ob, you know, objective side of things, if you think about the cause and effect, I mean, you can't really look at, you can't use those methods for spirituality. I think your relationship with the higher self, consciousness, God, whatever you want to call that is very subjective. And I think you have to be very open to your own experiences and and a lot of and just to be honest i didn't really know how to pursue that spiritual path either it took me a, a lot of i'm still not there you know like i'm not i'm not all knowing and i'm still trying to be i'm still trying to be whatever this is and it's hard and but these are these are this is why people like thomas campbell are are, are here robert monroe and Thomas Campbell and Dr. David Hawkins and Ram Das and a lot of different people that came before us that were trying to show us the way. They're all different in a sense, but they're all basically the same, just trying to help us. And to give you a little context about Thomas Campbell, I found him through um, Marla Fries, who was, I think it was like a couple episodes ago. She was uh, American Psychic. She is the author of that book. But I was a big fan of Robert Monroe, Bob Monroe, and his trilogy of out-of-body experiences. And what I really loved about his books, you know, some might say, oh, it's too woohoo, it's too weird for me, out-of-body experiences, that's not real. But Bob didn't believe that either. Like, he didn't think that this that was a possibility for himself. I mean, he thought he was crazy. Like, he would go to his best friends and get analyzed. I mean, his best friends were like psychologists and um, psychoanalysts and he would I mean he put himself through the ringer trying to figure out what was wrong with him and then he found out there was nothing wrong with him that he was actually having these experiences and so what did he do he started looking at it very scientifically all right if I'm gonna have these experiences I need to collect the data be a reporter 
and just see where this goes. And his three books are about his experiences. And that's what he does. I mean, he's not trying to push any beliefs on you. He's just reporting what the experiences are. And that's why I really enjoyed the books because he's not trying to push any dogma on you. He's just trying to get you to see his experience. And the cool thing is, is that Thomas Campbell, today's guest, was instrumental in Bob Monroe's experience. Well, I didn't say instrumental in his experiences, but in his development of the technology called Hemisync, which is an audible tool that you can use to get you into different states of mind, different states of consciousness to help you have these out-of-body experiences or help you experience different realms of possibility. And I just think that it's important to have these conversations like I have with uh, Mr. Campbell today because it pushes our belief systems. It pushes us in our, I guess it pushes us into being uncomfortable and that's where the growth is. I know a lot of people don't want to have these types of conversations because it tests their beliefs. But I think if you're not testing your beliefs, you're not growing. And yeah, I mean, Tom, Tom, Tom Campbell is, was one of the first people to test these hemi-sync technology and, and the test, um, the possibilities of experiencing the non-physical. When I say non-physical, we're in the physical right now. We feel we, we experience this realm of reality, but they were able to reach different levels of consciousness and go into a non-physical state, I guess. If you ever meditated hard enough, you might have reached this state where it is very formless and you can do whatever you want to do and it's kind of crazy and I know it sounds crazy, but they were able to collect a lot of data and bring it back and analyze it and make a lot of sense out of why we're here. And we talk about that today. And I'm very excited about that because I feel like this is, I'm, I'm right where I need to be in my journey in my, in my pursuit of spirituality. And this is just one of those stepping stones of, for me to get to where I need to be. And I'm not saying that I need to be anywhere, but it's helping me with my relationship with my spirituality, which is very subjective and I have to have it. It has to be my own. So (laughs) before we get into it, I want to give you a little clip of what's to come. I can, I can tell you three ways in which we create our own reality, Mm -hmm. three separate ways. One very obviously is by our behavior. If we, if our behavior is, let's say nice and friendly, then people like us. If our behavior is we're a user of people, you know, how can I use that person? what's in it for me, then people don't like us because we're not very nice. So that changes how people interact with us. So it affects our our reality. So that's an obvious one. Um, The next one is less obvious, but that is we get a data stream and we interpret it. Our reality is actually our interpretation of that data stream. Oh yeah, coming into 2021 pretty hot. I'm excited to hear your thoughts though. Go to tradedowns.com, leave me a message. If you guys have read his book, I'm very eager to talk to you and what your thoughts are. Um, But keep it, you know, again, 2021 is gonna be a fantastic year. I have a ton of great guests that are going to be, I guess, telling us their experiences and their subjective experiences with the higher consciousness, the higher universe, with God, with whatever you wanna call it. But the main, the main goal is to become more aware of what we are, expand our knowledge to learn more and to apply that to our lives that we're living right now in the moment. So I'm very excited for that. And I'm excited for you guys to uh, listen to this episode. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the great and powerful Tom Campbell. Hello, I'm Tom Campbell, and this is your superior self. Tom, um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining the show. This really is a treat. I'm excited to get into consciousness with you. Well, 
uh, thank you for inviting me, Trey. I'm sure. glad to be here. Yeah. Um, luckily enough, I was able to connect with Marla Freeze and she got me in touch with your people. And I really do appreciate, uh, you know, it just, it's funny how I look back and I, I think about the, the idiosyncrasies, you know, secreties of the world and, and how things work out. And it's just crazy that, um, not too long after I, I completed the Monroe books, here I am speaking with you. Um, it's pretty exciting for me anyway. Well, uh, you completed all three of yeah, Bob's all books? Three, all three. I actually did it <laughs> over, um, I listened to Audible and I just got, I just started researching your stuff. So you're the author of the big, my big toe trilogy. So that's my next, uh, <clears throat> my next stop is to start reading your stuff a little bit more. Well, you'll find mine to be, uh, a lot different than yeah. Bob Monroe's. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how different? Like what, what different? Like, I mean, well, well Bob Monroe, of course, as you know, he had out of bodies, didn't want to have them, but he just had them. And he kept track of his out of body experiences in a journal. And his books are basically that journal. It's just an account of his experiences. Hmm. Um, Bob at the time, of course, Bob wrote those what early 70s, late mm -hmm. 60s. <clears throat> the first one was probably late 60s. The uh, last one was probably closer to middle 70s. But in any case, uh, uh, when he wrote those, he was uh, of the mind that what he saw was exactly what was there, that his experiences defined another space, another place where things existed, just like things exist here in this space and place called the physical universe. So that was his mindset. And he was very good at being a reporter, you know, not adding anything to it, which sounds easy, but it's really not easy. You know, when you, when you get information, particularly information that's, that's unusual, it's hard to put that into language then put that into writing and actually capture it, you know, without adding your own twist and your own color and your own whatever to it. Mm -hmm. So Bob was good at saying, here's what happened. Here's what I saw. Here's what I said. This is what they said. And he was very good at that. Now, my book is entirely different. My book is, well, my three books, Bob wrote three, you know, I really have three too, you know, the, the My Big Toes, a trilogy. And my books are not about my experience. My books are a toe, a theory of everything. What happened is that after I spent 15 to 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe over you know, half a decade or more, <clears throat> I took the next 30, 35 years to try to figure out how did all this work? <laughs> Why did it work? Why did it have to be the way it was? You know, was you know, what was the logic behind it? What what are other things could one do with one's consciousness? And what did out of body mean? Just where was that? And mm -hmm. how real was it? And you know, why do some people like Bob and myself and others can do it on demand? And most other people, it just happens when it happens. It's not a thing that's easy for most people to control. So I wanted to answer all of those questions. Also, uh, all the things like how does one heal with their mind? Uh, you know, how does one re remote view? How does one get data out of this uh, intuitive space we call the larger system, you know, the source. So I spent a lot of time doing research in the out of body space, which means, say, just for an example, remote viewing and then changing a variable and seeing what difference that makes in my result, and then changing another variable, and doing that until I had some good idea what variables made a difference and why. Mm -hmm. So that took a long time, changing one variable at a time, and then doing 50 or 60 or 100 repetitions to see how that works, because every, every experience is a little unique. So you have to do a lot of them to get a sense of what's changing. Mm. So when I was done, I wrote this trilogy, mostly as a theory of consciousness. You know, how did consciousness work? What was consciousness? And I had 
established a set of facts about consciousness. These are the facts of consciousness. I'm a physicist, so I had already a set of facts about the physical world. Now, that's physics. And I started looking for one theory, one understanding that would explain all of them. And I was very certain that there was such an explanation or such a, a, you know, an idea that would explain all of those facts, both in the consciousness and in the physics. Because one of the facts of consciousness that I found early on was that consciousness is fundamental. It's more fundamental than the physical reality. And I came to that conclusion because I could easily do things within consciousness that would affect things in the physical world but it doesn't work the other way. I couldn't do things in the physical world that change things in consciousness in the same way. So that tells me that the arrow of causality is from consciousness to the physical world, that consciousness is the superset and that the physical world is the, is the subset. So I knew that if I understood consciousness well enough, I should be able to derive physics and those parts of physics that are unknown now, mm-hmm. like quantum mechanics, why should particles be described as probability distributions or relativity? Why should the speed of light be a constant? Or what, you know, where did that ball of plasma come from in the Big Bang before our universe even existed? It obviously didn't come from our universe. It came from someplace else. So there's lots of these dozens and dozens of these uh, um, unknowns, you know, things we know in physics are true because our experiments say they are, our theory points to them as being true, but we just have no idea why they're true, we call these paradoxes. And I was able to not only explain quantum physics and relativity, you know, derive them from first principles, uh, which physicists now can't do. They start with an assumption. Mm. relativity is based on the assumption that speed of light's constant and i can derive why that has to be and same with quantum mechanics i can derive why you know particles are probability distributions not really particles so i have i got some experiments now going on i uh, published a paper in a physics journal that explained my theory it was accepted peer reviewed published and now i'm doing those experiments some experiments to lend credibility and evidence to the fact that one, this is a virtual reality and two, that consciousness is the computer. So that's kind of a very short summary of who I am and where I came from and how I ended up, you know, what's a, what's a nice physicist like me doing in a place like this? Well, your background is insane, my man. Like you, you were, I mean, you've got what, two undergrads and, and, well mathematics i think it, one is one right yeah. mathematics and uh, physics physics yeah. and then um you were going trying to get well you were go you're, you were gonna get your doctorate you just happened to leave before you could get it um why was that like why'd you end up leaving before you could get it well you know i at the at the time <laughs> i can tell you the way i felt and then i kind of thought about it years later and understand there was more to it at the time, I uh, already had a master's degree working on the PhD. Um, typically, what one does is does some research that is new, original research, gets it published in a journal, in a peer reviewed journal, and that, that gets you your PhD. That's the key idea. Well, I did that. I did research in experimental nuclear physics. Uh, I wrote it up. It was... Uh, uh, it was actually found some something new in a nuclear resonance in a sodium-21 nucleus and wrote it all up to publish. And my major professor said, oh, that's good. Let's do another one. <laughs> that's that easy. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let's do another one. It'll only take you about a year. You know, we'll change targets and we can do another one. And at the time I was burn out you know mm. i'd been a i'd been a student since i started kindergarten at five years old and now i was in my late 20s and i was still a student because getting a phd in physics is not a four-year process it's more like a 
seven year process. It takes longer. It's the research. It's not something you do quickly in sure. physics. It's very complicated research and it takes a long time. So I was done and I felt like I was being uh, abused, you know, like all graduate students really are because, you know, they, they work for peanuts and, you know, they're very highly technical people that, you know, work for very little, yeah, very little money. So I just said, no, not going to do that. I'm gone, you know, so I just left and I got a job, which was rather miraculous because right at that time uh, we were in a, a economic slump and there just weren't jobs. You know, it was really, really hard to get a, to get a job because industry was, was decreasing and laying off, not, not hiring. So it was hard, but this job just came up and before it ever got announced, I heard about it, made a connection, got a job, right, you know, bold of blue, right out of the, right out of the sky. So mm -hmm. I took this job, and within a couple of months, the, my boss at that job introduced me to Bob Monroe's first book, mm -hmm. and asked me to read it, tell me what he thought. You know, so I did, and I said, well, you know, if if he's making this up, then well, it's a nice story. But if it's real, you know, if he's not just trying to sell books, then wow, you know, this really shows that there's another piece of reality that's unknown. Well, I'm a physicist and what we do is model reality. That's the job. So it was about a month after that, that uh, we found out that Bob Monroe lived not that far away from where we worked. So a bunch of us got together and went out to meet him. And sure enough, uh, you know, my idea was, is this guy, is this guy a, a faker? You know, is, <laughs> is he making this stuff up to sell books or, or what? Well, you drive up to his house at that time and, and you know, it was this uh, country, country mansion on a hill, whiteboard fences, you know, I don't know. I think he had like 100 acres, horses running in the field along the fence, you know, following the cars, a lake. It was obviously somebody who didn't need, you know, to sell books yeah. to make money. You know, he particularly a, a genre like out of body. He's not going to make a lot of money. You know, that's that's not a subject that's on everybody's wish list. So sure. obviously he didn't write that to make money. It wasn't about selling books. And then when I talked to him, he was a very rational, mm -hmm. very level, you know, very solid kind of guy. And he was just built a lab, didn't know what to do with it. He wanted to study consciousness to make it real, you know, to make it not just a crazy old guy that had these things happen to him, but he wanted to understand it. So he had money. He had lots of money to do that. So he built a lab and he was looking for people and I got an offer to work with him. And that's when I started working with Bob Monroe. Now, none of that would have happened and I said, all right, I'm going to just go on with my degree, you know, one more year, plug and jug, and out will come another paper, and then you'll let me out, right? And so I... I say you made a pretty good decision. Um, yeah, so my whole life changed. Everything in my life took a different change after that. And that job I got was just a flash that, you know, like a friend told a friend told a friend mm -hmm. kind of thing that I got that if I hadn't been at just the right place, just the right time, that would never have happened. I wouldn't have made that connection. I wouldn't have run into journeys out of the body, probably a book I never would have picked up. So That's that awesome. made all the difference. And then I look back at it and I say, you know, that was not like me. I'm a very laid back kind of guy. And the fact that they were going to hold me up for another year, uh, I would have shrugged my shoulders and said, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. If that's the price I got to pay. What's another year? That would be more typical Tom Campbell. But for some reason, I just couldn't do that. I had to go. I just had this, this drive, this push. I needed to go. There was somewhere, something else I needed to do. You know, time's wasting. I have to get on the train. You know, the train's ready to leave. So I had that sense, but didn't know why. And now I know why. You know, that was the system nudging me to make this connection so that I would end up connected to Bob Monroe through this through this job. And that's why I got that particular job and with that particular boss and all the rest of it worked. So you now sometimes system the system nudging. gives us nudges. 
And that was looking back on it. Now it's obvious why I suddenly was so burnt out when that's really not my character to be yeah. burnt out. I just kind of keep on trudging. Keep going. It, Lay yeah, back. That's, that's what I do. So in any case, uh, now I look back at it and I said, all right, it was time for me to make this connection. And the system misjudged the, the professor uh, and his choice to kind of hold me up for another, yeah. for another year. Yeah. So wow. anyway, that's why I didn't get the PhD. So I well, did that's a the pretty work. good reason. <laughs> I did the work. You know, I passed all the tests. I took the qualifiers. I passed them on my first try. And all of that was done. All the coursework was done. It was just the thesis, and I just left short after finishing one thesis and needed to do another one to get out. Yeah, uh, um, that, that is a lot of work, a lot of research. I, I've, I'm researching right now. I want to go, I'm going back to school. I want to get a, my goal to myself. My gift to myself is to get a PhD in, in psychology, whether that's counseling or something in that maybe uh, I've been looking at um, – transpersonal psychology as well and and but you know it i'm just enjoying the expansion of knowledge right like i'm just i'm loving the the journey um like i'm getting the same type of feeling that you got like right the the source nudging me in that direction and i'm just following my the mm -hmm. vibration you know like the the fire in my belly when i when i research something like i cannot wait to go to psychology class and read about theories and hypotheses and data collection and statistics and mm -hmm. i mean it's not physics but it's it's very interesting to me um physics is tough though like i'm just learning about the quantum physics and the you know the quantum mechanics not like in depth like your level but like the basics of that right the um i i've read some dr joe dispenza lately and and reading some of his um his thoughts on he doesn't have a peer review uh article i don't think but he, he talks he does have a couple books out talking about like the the self-healing technique of being able to go in and meditate and, and um allowing yourself to get out into the field and he says he has a lot of data collected that it has has data to support the idea that we can heal ourselves sure and you were talking about that earlier but you said something earlier that caught my attention it was like you you can manipulate your not manipulate but the consciousness can manipulate the physical right sure How, can you give me an example of that oh well there's multiple ways that happens well that you just mentioned the uh, healing you can heal yourself mm -hmm. you can heal other people you can modify you know there's a thing called the placebo effect that says if you tell somebody that they're going to get well you're going to give them a wonderful medicine and and they they are get very positive then they have like a there's a like 35 percent of the people all they need to heal is to be positive and it's not that then they just think they're better, but they really get better against a control group that everything else was exactly the same, except they didn't get the positive message. And there's about a 35% increase of, of healing, you know, over the control group. And that's way statistically significant. Sure. So the placebo effect is a real thing. Well, that's something where consciousness affects the physical reality. Um, when you do remote viewing, you're picking up information on the physical reality. You can pick up information on the state of someone's health or the state of someone's spiritual quality or, you know, what happened in the past. There's all sorts of information out there that uh, is accessible. And, of course, I wanted to know, well, where does that information come from and why is it there? <laughs> you know, I mean, why, is that, why does that information have to be there? What's its purpose? What's its point? And, you know, I, of course, I, sol I solved that problem, too. It, it's, it has to be there to, because of the requirements of the rendering engine that creates this virtual reality. It's data that that rendering engine needs to use. Hmm. So that's why it gets there. And it needs to be there in the probable future. But then as time goes by, that same data just becomes the, you know, the past probabilities. Wow. That's uh, that I've never, never thought about it like that. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so when you met Robert Monroe, were you like, mm -hmm. you didn't have out of body experiences pr prior, prior to that, right? Well, I did, but a long way prior to that, really? I had out of body experiences when I was five, six, seven, 
and uh, learned to go out of body really? on my own. I was taught. I ran into some entities who got me out of body mm -hmm. and then proceeded to, to uh, teach me. And that's in the first the first part of the first book. I do a little history of you know myself. Sure. And uh, so I did that. But by the time I was seven or so, that door was shut. And I didn't have any out of bodies, and I kind of forgot about it. You know, it was just a, a thing that happened. So it wasn't that remarkable. It was just, you know, a thing to happen because you don't have much idea of how you are different compared to other people. So I hadn't uh, thought about it at all for many, many years, although I always had, I was always able to just ask questions, but I didn't think really to who or to what I just mm -hmm. pose a question and get answers that I could always do that. And anyway, it, when I got with Bob in like 1971, very early 70, 72, about a year or two into that relationship with Bob, Bob told me about one of the out of bodies that he had had the previous night. I say, I spent a lot of time with Bob, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. 15 to 20 hours a week. So we had just a lot of conversations yeah. and he was talking about an out of body he had. It was like a test. He'd, he was asked to answer this test question. And, and then if he got that right, he'd get another one. If he got that right, he'd get another one. And he was going through this, this series of tests that he got. And when he told me the, um, the first one, it kind of rang a bell because that was familiar to me. And then the second one rang the bell even louder. And I realized that I had done that when I was between five and seven, you know, sometime in that time, I had taken that same test. So I stopped him and I said, okay, now the, you, this was the answer you got for the second one, right? And he said, right. And I said, well, here's the third one. And I told him the third one and his jaw dropped because that was exactly what his third one was. And I told him, well, when I took that, that's the answer I got. And he said, that's what he got too. So then we went on to the fourth one and I told him what that was. And it seems that on the fifth one was the last one we both took and we both had the same answer. So it, whether they were right or wrong, whether that was right in the end of the sequence or whether it was wrong and that's where, the, that's where we got stopped, neither one of us really knew. Yeah. But at that point, everything started to come back to me. I started to remember all of that stuff that was going on when I was very young. And over the next probably six months or so, all those memories poured back, poured back in. And that, uh, so I can't say that I had never done that before, but I hadn't done it for a long, long time, but it wasn't that hard to pick it back up again. Sure. Once, once Bob was, was teaching me. Wow, man, I can I can only imagine what that conversation was like. So this test, is this something that you were talking about, the, the questions and answers? Is this something that they administered to people at the Institute? Like, what test are you talking about? No, this is a test administered by, by in non-physical space altogether. This, really? is not a, this is not a physical test. This is a test that happens when you're out of body, when you're not in your body. You're out interacting. So that you get a test when you're out, out of your body? You get tests sometimes, yes. You get like, tests. And can you give me an example that, of a question? Sure. The uh, Well, in this particular test, the uh, first question was almost silly, and that was something like, uh, would you rather uh, you know, have this chest of money, lots of money, or learn something new? And the right answer is learn something new. Yeah. Obvious, you know, it was a test to see where you were as far as in your evolutionary process, how mm -hmm. much ego, how much fear, how much uh, belief, you know, was controlling mm -hmm. your choices. And they, they were given, and they're routinely given to people when they go out of body just to get the system has some idea of where they are, and what it is they need to, to learn, you know, what is going to frighten them. Because if they're too much, if they have too much fear, the out of body is going to turn out to be a bad experience. They're going to run into that fear out mm. there, and it won't be so pleasant. And they'll end up being worse off than they were before they they went. So the system wants to know who should it encourage and who should it discourage as far as the out of body goes. And 
what kind of things should it give them afterwards? Mm-hmm. That out of body experience, the best model to to kind of explain it is that it's like a single player virtual reality game, and the system is playing all the characters that are in it, and you are playing yourself, and you're interacting with all those characters, and there's things for you to learn. There's things for you to, to experience and do, choices to make. So that's probably the best description of what an out-of-body experience is. You get a different data stream than you do that defines this physical universe reality. That's a data stream. It's a virtual reality. Out of body is a different virtual reality, different data stream. And mostly it's a single player. It's a single player game. It doesn't have to just be a single player game. Myself and the, the friend who also worked the same place I did went out to meet Bob the same time I did and also worked with me. You know, we went out of body together once. So then it was a double player. You know, it was two players in that game because we interacted we uh, talked with each other. We mm-hmm. connected, and all of that was being recorded from each of us. We were we were in isolation booths, acoustically isolated, and I was electromagnetically isolated as well. And we each had microphones, and we're describing what it is we were doing, what we were saying, you know, what was going on, and independently. So we were making two cassette tapes. You can know how old that is when I say cassette <laughs> tapes, you know, so we were each doing cassette tapes and uh, at the end, you know, we get out of our booths and we come up to the control room where Bob was and he played both the tapes for us, you know, started them at the same time. So they would be coordinated and they would mm-hmm. be synced in time. And there was Dennis and I asking and answering each other's questions, you know, asking questions, getting answers, talking, Oh, do you see that thing over there? You mean that thing? Yes. You know, and over to the right of that thing, do you see that that round bulbous thing? Oh, yeah, I see that. Let's go explore. You know, so we were obviously interacting and we're together. So that was not a single player game, but at least a two player sure. game. And you talk about the, uh, the the boots, right? Like, um, so the method that you guys were utilizing, that's the uh, hemisync, right? Like the yeah. Uh, make allowing the two hemispheres of the brain to um i i don't really understand it but it's you're using sound waves right to get into different states of consciousness yeah it's a thing called binaural beats and actually it was dennis who first saw that he found binaural beats talked about in an article in scientific american that was back in the late 60s and at the time we were going out to the lab just trying to somehow isolate some of these paranormal things so that we could discover what, what made them work, you know, and how, and how they worked. So he came to me at work and he said, Hey, look, at these binaural beats, what they say here is they entrain brainwaves. Hmm. In other words, you're, you play a, a, a pure tone in this ear and another pure tone in that ear, but the two tones are a little different. And what you hear is the, is a frequency that's the difference, the difference frequency. So I have 100 hertz, 104 hertz. I'll hear a four hertz. Four hertz means four times a second, like bum, 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 That's like four bumps a second. And I'll hear a tone like that inside my head. Well, it's because one tone goes into you know the right hemisphere. The other one goes to the left hemisphere. Those two signals cross at the corpus callosum, which is the membrane, the, the between the hemispheres and actually mixes there. And when it does that, it tends to push you into a, an EEG state. You know, it's a, it's an encephalogram. It's where the electrodes are on your head and it measures mm-hmm. the electromagnetic energy mm-hmm. around your head that is dominant. Your energy in that EEG is the same as the difference frequency. So you raise the difference frequency up and you'll see the EEG starts, you know, the energy goes up to a higher frequency. So that's what's called brainwave entrainment. The, the difference frequency would tend to push a person into a particular brainwave state. So we wanted to be at around four hertz, a theta state. Mm-hmm. Theta state is that region just before you lose consciousness, delta, the next one down, which is around two hertz, is unconscious. That's your deep sleep. Theta is one that 
you're right on the edge. You're mm -hmm. about to fall off into delta. Uh, if you go up, the next one up in frequency is, is alpha. And alpha is like 8, 10, somewhere in there. And that's where you're very mellow. You know, you're very relaxed. And, uh, but not sleeping. Theta then is on the border between awake and sleeping and delta is asleep. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to be right at that theta state. The reason we wanted to be there was one, people who were very good meditators, like monks who've been meditating for the last 30 years, they tended to have all of their EEG energy focused on around four hertz. And Bob Monroe got a pulsation state that was four hertz just as he went out of body, just before he went out of body. Hmm. So we made a, an assumption, put those two things together, and went to the lab and started making binaural beat tapes and playing them. And actually, Bob was out of town. He was doing a program at Esselhyn in uh, Big Sur, California <laughs> at that time. And when he came back, we had about two weeks worth of, of work where we had optimized the binaural beats, you know, like what, what bass frequency and how long and exactly what was the difference frequency. And we'd been playing with it for a couple of weeks to optimize it. So that's where Hemisync really came from. Bob had sounds before that, but they, they were not as effective. They were, they were good. They were relaxing sounds, sort of surfy. Didn't sound exactly like surf, but kind of had a, uh, it was a pink noise that was, that was uh, uh, oscillators had a, a basic four hertz beat because Bob had that four hertz vibration and he put that together too. So then we added the, the binaural beat to that, and suddenly it became a lot more potent as far as people having that experience, out-of-body experience. So that's where it came from. So, yes, we were, we were in separate booths. There were three booths, a control room, and then three booths. And these three booths were all acoustically isolated, so you could shout in one of them, and all you'd hear outside the door or in the next room is a little, you know, a little muffled rumble. You really couldn't make anything out. And if you were just talking in a normal voice, you didn't hear anything at all. Yeah. And I always was in booth one and booth two was empty. And the next booth down was three and that's where Dennis was. So we basically had, you know, two booths worth of isolation acoustically between us. And then we had this microphone hanging on two strings down from the ceiling that was about an inch above our lips. And as we experienced things, we would tell Bob what we were experiencing. Now, that's not typical for people doing out of body that they're talking at the same time, because talking is a physical thing. Yeah. But Bob taught us to do that. And with practice, you can do that without much difficulty. It just takes practice to get used to it. Because otherwise, he couldn't coach us if he didn't know what we were experiencing. Sure. And to coach us after the fact wasn't nearly as effective as coaching us while we were there. So that's how we worked. So we'd go in and lay down on these water beds, a single bed, and uh, have this microphone right above our lips and turn out the lights. And we'd have a headset on and Bob would be in the control room and, you know, he'd turn on a tape machine to record everything that we did. So what he said was recorded and what so I said and Dennis said were all recorded on three different tracks. You know, we had a eight track. <laughs> That's another <laughs> thing that goes back a little bit. Yeah, we had eight track recorder. We had a big reel to reel uh, four track recorder. And that was the setup. So that's how we basically worked. Uh, that is just so the, amazing. I bet you can probably produce some pretty amazing sound uh, sounds now with the technology that you guys have. Yeah, yeah, I do. Matter of fact, if anybody's interested in those sounds, you can go to MBT Events, www.mbtevents.com, and there's a whole set of sounds that I have. It's I think 14 different uh, binaural beat tapes. I think it costs about 20 bucks or something like that. I'm definitely getting something. Can you, can and, you download them straight to your phone? Yeah, you can download them to a phone or any place that you want. And yeah. those are the ones that I use in a course that I give called an immersive course. It's like a, a four-day course or something that we 
that we work on. And I teach people how to get in touch with the larger conscious system, how to communicate telepathically with other consciousness. That other consciousness could be dead or alive or a dog or a cat, you know, just something that's conscious. How do you communicate conscious to conscious and telepathically? And I teach getting data out of the databases, remote viewing, healing, and finally just exploring. Yeah. So that's a course. And I've generated these binaural beats to help the people that are in that course, but you, anybody can, anybody can get them in there. They're, Have you ever had a deep cheap. conversation with someone who's had a near death experience and kind of compared notes about your out of body and their near death and oh, any sure. similar, any similarities in the two? Because I feel like with your and Bob's, um, research and, and data that you've collected, it seems like you guys can do whatever you want, like go anywhere that you want. And, and when I, like I've read Dr. Eben Alexander's account of his mm -hmm. near death experience, and it seems like they're two different two different stories. Can you touch on that a little bit? Like what yeah. is your experience with that? They're not, well, they are two different stories, but it's, it's mostly because the near death experience is a, is a limited experience, but they're really pretty much the same thing at the fundamental level, at the basic level. What happens is that they let go of the data stream here Okay, which is easy because they're on drugs. <laughs> they've been put out, you know, with pain medications and other things. They they've had anesthesia, so letting go of this data stream is is very simple at that point. Then they get a data stream that starts to define another reality, and in this other reality, well, it depends. You know, if you look at the whole class of near death death experiences, all of them aren't the wonderful light, the love, you know, like even got. Some of them are scary. Some of them are, are uh, terrifying. Not many, a, a smaller amount, but some of them are like that. So you get all kinds, and some of them are kind of bland and don't have a, a, you know, a, any kind of big wow behind them. And, but there's a very large minority that do have a big wow behind them, and they all are pretty much the same experience. You know, they find themselves aware in some other reality. And they often they'll see a, a light or some sort of thing that kind of attracts them to move toward the light. And then they find that this light is immense, awesome, full of, full of love and caring. And they forget who they are. Their own identity disappears and they just merge with this thing. And they feel that they are connected to everything, all of their consciousness, all of their things, every blade of grass, you know, every twig, everything. They're a part of it, and it's a part of them. And they have this oneness with not only this this, this uh, kind of being of light, but it's uh, a oneness with everything. And they experience this, and it's so beautiful and peaceful. And it's a, you know, it's an experience that's transformative. It's an experience that when you come back from that, you're not the same person. You're different after that, because this tells you what it could be like, you know, what, yes. that, that there is another, you know, that there is more to reality than the physical. And it's not only more to it, but it is fundamental. It's significant. It's important. It's the real deal. And what we have here in this physical reality is just a, a subset for us to make choices in, to learn, to grow. So they get this. And, you know, if you've read Eben and you've read others, it's a similar kind of thing. Yeah. And often they're given an opportunity to come back or not, or sometimes they're just told, no, you got to go back because mostly when you're in that state, you don't want to come back. You know, this is much more pleasant than anything you've ever experienced before. And going back, it's like, no way. So typically they're told, you're, it's not your time yet. You have to go back. And usually the person feels like, no, I don't want to go back. I want to stay here. But you go back anyway. Yeah. And what has happened is the source. There is a source. I say consciousness is fundamental. So I just call this consciousness, I call it the larger consciousness system. And that's just source. This is consciousness. Consciousness is an information system. And that's not too hard to understand because, you know, you're conscious, what you're conscious of 
is the data that you collect through your five senses. Mm-hmm. You shut off all those five senses, then you're not aware of anything. You're a, you're a point of consciousness floating in a black void. You know, you don't see, hear, taste, smell, feel anything. Well, you're, it's the day car moment. <laughs> you, you, you're aware and that's it, but there's nothing to be aware of. You have no sense data. So consciousness is really about information. So in any case, this, this larger consciousness system takes these people, gives them this data stream, gives them the experience of moving to the light and becoming one, which is basically an experience of what consciousness, what highly evolved consciousness is like. This is what it's like to be a fully evolved consciousness. So they get that experience, and then they get sent back. And often, whatever was ailing them gets taken away. You know, over the next week or two, they go from going to die in any minute to being healthy. And that's because they're supposed to tell other people about it. They're supposed to spread that word. They're supposed to write books that go on, on programs like this and you know, talk about it so that people get an idea that this reality is bigger than just the physical. And there's a reason why the system is trying to, to make that idea, you know, a more common idea to spread that idea. And we can talk about that if you. If yeah, you know. man, definitely. You got me all fired up over here. I'm like, you're <laughs> I'm on my edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the first time in the history of humanity, we now have an opportunity to make major growth steps in evolution of our consciousness. We've always had people who had the bigger picture and understood consciousness. You know, we have the Buddha almost 2,500 years ago who said this physical reality is an illusion, you know, and what the point is, is to care. It's the you know, compassion. It's, it's love. It's, it's about other. That's the key thing. This is just a place to make choices and to grow up in. This is a schoolhouse. Well, he said all that, and that's all true. That's exactly the way it is. And you've had, you know, other, you know, not just the Buddha, but most of the religions fundamentally come down to the purpose here is to care about other, you know, turn the other cheek. God is love. You know, it's a statement out of the New Testament, Christianity. Um you know, turn the other cheek, doing to others as you have done to yourself. You know, it's all about being a good person, caring about other people. Well, those ideas are available to anybody who takes the time to explore them. In other words, the, 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 the exploration of inner space is cheap. All it takes is time. <laughs> you have to put the time in, you know, to do it. But if you put the time in and you put it in over years, you'll find all these things out for yourself firsthand, that that is the nature of reality. So the Buddha explored inner space and he figured it all out and others have before him and others have now. It's not that hard to do because it's only, it's only cost is time and persistence. Whereas say the exploration of outer space is really tough because that takes, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars and a lot of very expensive equipment. That's not easy to do, but exploring inner space is easy. So we've always had these little bubbles of enlightenment popping up throughout the ages, but they've always stayed in the margins. They've never actually gone mainstream to where the mass of humanity says, oh yeah, right. That's why we're here to become love, to care, you know, about each other. That's never made it into the mainstream. Well, there's reasons for that. You know, it's like it was generally isolated locally. You know, back in Buddhist time, you know, just to go 20 miles from where you are is a big deal. You know, you walk for a couple of days to do that. So things didn't spread. You didn't get worldwide humanity, you know, getting an idea because it it just kind of worked its way around, went from place to place. But it, it, uh, it, it's always on the outside of the power structure. 
So we had mainstream religion, but mostly in the West anyway, that was a big business. You know, it was big money and a lot of real estate and, you know, yeah. expenses and you know it was a power and it was a it was a lot of power and influence so it was a different kind of thing you know it wasn't uh, and you had lots of them and they were all competing with each other and you know my way is the only way you know you go my way you go to heaven if you go their way you go to hell and yeah. it was very competitive so it, it wasn't mainstream and then we had science and when science came up and began to take over the kind of the the belief, you know. Well, I, I say that the scientists now are the are the uh, high priests of Western culture, you know. But Western culture is all over the world, so really they're the high the high priests of humanity, pretty much, because the high priests are the people that tell everybody else what to believe, and we believe the scientists. So if the scientists say this is the way it is, then everybody says that's the way it is because mm-hmm. the scientists. Don't tell lies. They do experiments, mm-hmm. and that's the way it is. So we trust them, and we we believe them. Five hundred years ago, it was the high priests of religion who told people what to believe. So there's, you know, so now we have the high priests. Well, instead of having a bunch of kind of religious or ethical ideas bouncing around, but none of them actually capturing the mainstream humanity, now we can change that. We have an internet. Now we have what two thirds of the, you know, of the adult population, and probably quite a bit younger than the adult population added to that, is online. Yeah. Or knows people that are online. So now ideas spread quickly. Ideas can go wide. The next so that solves the spread the the idea of, of local geography. I mean, it gets over that problem. And Mm -hmm. now the high priests of Western culture are going to, in probably the next decade, say that this reality is definitely a virtual reality. They're going there because that's just better physics. That's what their experiments are telling them. That's what their quantum mechanics has been telling them now for about 100 years, and they have been trying to work around it and get around it and they can't and now it's coming from all sorts of other angles you have biology bruce lipton says consciousness is what's fundamental you have neurophysics um what's the guy's name uh, it'll come to me in a minute anyway he he says that uh, his neuro his neuroscience tells him that uh, this physical reality is like a user interface Sort of mm-hmm. like, you know, your computer screen, that it's not really the nuts and bolts. It's not the, it's not the processors and, and the memory and all of that. It's the user interface. And that's what our reality is. So he shows that and he has a mathematical model to back it up. So these ideas are coming now from all over. You have lots of people who are coming to the same conclusions and the physicists are coming to that same conclusion and they will because it's better you can solve a lot of these these uh physics problems these paradoxes in physics once you see that this is a virtual reality and once you see that consciousness is a computer so ideas you know big big paradigm shifts take a long time to happen they don't happen overnight they take a long time and this one's been bubbling on the sidelines, and I'd say that right now, probably 20-30% of the physicists in the world think virtual reality is a pretty good idea. Whereas just 10, 15 years ago, that was probably one half of one percent. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's still a minority, but it's it's growing because that's the only way that you can explain experiments. Yeah. Uh, I remember looking at a, a, a group of physicists being interviewed back when they were looking at the Higgs boson. Remember the God article? Yeah. Uh, physicists, physicists they, they, do, they make up a lot of creative uh, <laughs> uh, names for the, for the press. But anyway, and this, this group this was trying to explain to this reporter, and they said, well, look, 
You know, it used to be that people thought an electron was a little chunk of mass with a charge. And they said, but it isn't. It can't be, because if we model an electron as a chunk of mass with a charge, we can't get the right answers about what comes out of these atom smashers. It says we can get the right answers if we model an electron as a point with the attributes of mass and the attributes of charge. Well, that's how you model an electron with information. Attributes are just information. It's a point with attributes. That's a simulation. So physicists are going that way. They can't get right answers with little particles and chunks of mass. It doesn't work. Yeah. That's not the way the world really is. Yeah. So in any case, scientists, particularly physicists, are getting to that point. And within another decade or less, I think they're going to say, yes, this reality is a virtual reality. It's a com That means it's a information-based reality that's the way they will phrase it well, can you change the variables for yourself like if you like you say virtual reality in a game i can change some of the the variables in it right like can i if i if i'm not particularly in love with i don't know let's let's say what some of the mainstream problems are let's say uh job uh, uh I don't know, job mostly uh relationships location because of that virtual reality can we manipulate it to produce uh, what we want out of that game? Yeah, there are ways we can manipulate it. We can't manipulate it, all the parts of it, but there's some pieces of it we can manipulate. Yes. Um, I can I can tell you three ways in which we create our own reality. Mm -hmm. Three separate ways. One, very obviously, is by our behavior. If we if our behavior is let's say nice and friendly, then people like us. If our behavior is we're a user of people, you know, how can I use that person? What's in it for me? Then people don't like us because we're not very nice. So that changes how people interact with us. So it affects our, our reality. So that's an obvious one. Um, the next one is less obvious, but that is we get a data stream and we interpret it our reality is actually our interpretation of that data stream. Hmm. Now, when we interpret that data, that interpretation is clouded by our past experience, you know, our knowledge base. How much do we know? How ignorant are we? Uh, um, how, what, how much fear do we have? What sort of beliefs do we have? So, I mean, that's, that's also obvious in the sense that, you know, five people standing on the same street corner watching the same accident will issue five very different reports of that accident. Depends on what they noticed, what caught their attention, and beliefs that they had, prejudices that they already had, you know, about driving and about this and that. You know, let's say there's somebody there who just really has a hard attitude toward young drivers and feels young drivers just aren't safe. And if one of those drivers is young, and that person is going to see that young driver as more likely the problem yeah. and the cause than it would be if they didn't have that belief. You see, so we take in data, we interpret it, and that becomes our, that interpretation is our reality to us. Everybody lives in their own reality. Hmm. Now, there's things we can't change, which is the basic rule set, the physics. The chemistry, the biology, that's part of the rule set. And we can't just change the rule set like, oh, I'd like to be able to fly. You know, so I changed the rule set. And now I can fly. Well, that doesn't work because the rule set's the rule set. And the same in your virtual reality. You know, if you're playing a character in a virtual reality and you'd suddenly like to be rich, you can't just say, oh, I'd like to have a whole lot of money in my bank or I'd like to teleport someplace. Because if the virtual reality rule set doesn't support that, then you can't do it. You're kind of locked into that. Okay. But another thing that is probably the least obvious is that, is that your intention, and this is where we started with our conversation, your intention can modify future probability. Now we have free will. The future is not deterministic. It depends on our choices and we have free will to make choices, but there are probabilities. In other words, if there are 10 different things that I could do, I choose one of those to do. 
But each one of those has a certain probability. This one may have a probability of 0.2. The other one might be a 0.8. The other one might be a 0.999 because that's the one I pick almost all the time. And the other one might be 0.001 because that one I'd be unlikely. So that's, the, that's, that's all the possibilities. And I get to pick those. So there's a certain probability function of what will happen next. And that's true of, you know, rocks rolling downhill and, you know, the way the weather changes and so on. So it's a probabilistic simulation, not a deterministic simulation. The rule set at the bottom is mostly deterministic with some statistics and, and randomness involved in it. But how we interact and what we do is all at the probability level. That's why particles are probability. You know, how we interact with this world is at the probability level. So in any case, we can modify those probabilities with our intent. That's what the placebo effect is. We change our intention. We're happy now. We got this wonderful pill. So we get better. We change the probabilities. People can use their intent to heal themselves and other people. And it works. It works better if the person who's ill also has a positive intent. But if you're good at healing others, even if they don't, you can still heal them. Although they will probably then find some other illness to, <laughs> you know, to, to create because you're not going to overrun their free will. They have, yeah. they, they have more power over themselves than, than you do. So that's ways that you can modify. So if, if um, you know, we, back in the 1950s, uh, there was a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, you know, and indeed that is a power. That is, if you think positively, you will live in a more positive world. You will smile more. You will be happier. Your relationships will be better if you're a positive person. If you're a negative person, you know, constantly uh, full of self-pity, oh, woe is me, you know, everything's terrible, everything happens to me, life isn't fair. You know, one of those things, what did the blues song say? If I, you know, if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have no luck at all. You know, that's, uh, you know, that kind of an attitude creates problems. All sorts of things go wrong. You have all these difficulties that you're dealing with all the time because that negative intention manifests negative stuff yeah. in your life. So positive intention manifests positive stuff in your life. So you can't just get what you want because that intention has to change probability. So you may change something from one in a million to one in a thousand, and you're still not likely to get it, even though you lowered that probability a whole lot. Good for you. You're a wizard. But you're not going to get it because it, you know, it was too much to have to do. So you can't just do anything. And for a lot of things, there's other people pulling in the other way. Let's say... I don't want it to rain tomorrow because I'm planning a family picnic. But there's farmers out there who want it to rain tomorrow because they need it for their crops. So we got intentions to make it rain and intentions to not make it, you know, to make it not yeah. rain. Well, all those intentions are, you know, one's pushing, the other's pulling, and it'll do whatever all that amounts to. So it's, it, uh, you know, and that'll be an influence mm -hmm. on it. Again, it's just an influence. It changes probability. It wow. doesn't mean that it's just the people's intention that, that is what makes it happen. It also comes with an, in, an inherent probability you know, of, of, of doing that. So all you're doing is changing probability. So if there is no rain anywhere, you know, everything is dry mm -hmm. and there's no moisture in the air for you know, 500 miles in every direction, expecting it to rain in an hour, is a very low probability, you see. So that's much harder to do that than if it's, yeah, there's splotchy rain here and there and whatever, yeah. and it's not raining where you are. Well, now it's much easier to make it rain where you are, you see, because yeah. the probability isn't so high. Yeah. So the, to change that probability. So that's how you can use your intent to modify physical reality. And the reason we have that ability is because any good schoolhouse needs to give its students feedback. And that's the big feedback mechanism, because that way we get to create 
our reality to a large extent. Okay, so it's not only how we interpret it, that creates our reality, but also how positive or negative we are, that creates our reality. Hmm. So if you look around outside today and you see, you know, what's the world like? What are people like? Well, it's pretty ugly out there for the most part. You know, there's a lot of self-centeredness, a lot of greed, a lot of nastiness, a lot of grabby uh, actions going on, a lot of control, power, force, you know, being, being uh, used. Well, that's because that's the way we are. That mm -hmm. is an accurate representation of the quality of consciousness of humanity. So that's the world we create. And when we individually let go of that fear and ego and beliefs, then we'll live in a nicer place. Yeah. Institutions, the politics, the economics will all change when we change. And if we don't change, none of that stuff's going to change. If we don't change, you can go out there and replace that dictator with a nice guy and replace that CEO with a nice guy. And in a short amount of time, it goes right back to the way it was. Yeah. That nice guy doesn't live forever. And it's just going to go back to the way it was. You know, it's not, uh, you know, what did we have? You know, we had the French Revolution. It was all about freedom. And what did the French Revolution do? Gave, it, gave control to Napoleon. Yeah. You know, they went that from guy. one they went from one dictator to another dictator. Yeah. You see? So that's typical because the people that you know that reflects the people. So that's the that's kind of how the big the big picture works. And that's why the system is trying to help us see this bigger picture because now we have an internet. Now these ideas can spread all over, not just a little group here and there. And now we're going to have the high priests say that this is a virtual reality, which then makes it credible and goes yeah. mainstream. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, that's the problem. The high priests back when they were, when they were uh, religious, say 500, 600, 800 years ago, they didn't want to say things like that because they were in positions of power. It was about politics. It was about yeah. who could, who could mm -hmm. uh, overwhelm who, you know, it, was, oh. it wasn't so much about spreading love and peace around the world as it was about, you know, mm -hmm. how much wealth and power could you, could you get? So we weren't ready yet, yeah. but we've I think grown we're up a lot. So. I think we're getting there, right? Like I think people are yeah. wanting that. I think, you yeah, know, exactly. I think we need that. I think I don't, I'd see a lot we of, do. I see a lot of darkness and I, I see, a, you know, social media drives that a little bit. And I, the message that I hear from you about the, the overall, like if, if you had one last message to mankind, it would be love each other as yourself. Right. Is that what you learned <clears throat> from your out of body experiences? Was that the, the lesson that, you know, all through your travels, like, was that the, the, the message that was always repeated? Well, it's not that that message was repeated, but eventually, you know, this is a, a, an evolution game. When we, we evolve the quality of our consciousness, consciousness is an, evo is an evolving system. And as you evolve, as you get rid of the fear, as you get rid of the, the ego and get rid of beliefs, you should believe nothing. You know, you should always be skeptical. And yes, including about what I say, you know, you should always be skeptical. If it's not your own experience, then it's not your truth. You should always be skeptical. In any case, in that growth path, the more you unload the fear and the ego and the beliefs, the more you see that what's left is love and that that's the only thing that really works. If you have a social system, which we have, you know, humans create a social system. Yes, a family you know, a country, the world, but it's a social system. And in a social system, you optimize what that social system can do through cooperation, through caring, through love. And if you apply fear and ego and beliefs, you, 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 you tear it apart. You know, you don't optimize it. You make it very suboptimal if you do that. So in, you know, what I've been doing this now for probably 40 years or so, and over time, as you evolve, 
it just becomes obvious to you that the whole point why we're here is to grow up, is to evolve the quality of our consciousness. And in my model, I can, you know, my model is a very logical model, not just, not just words. And then that, it, it, that can be said in terms of we're reducing the entropy of our consciousness. This is an information system. And information is, information reduces the randomness. Information is a good thing. You know, if you've got, you got an information system and all the bits are random, there's no information. That's high entropy. If you order those bits around to mean something, now you've just lowered entropy. You've created order where there was randomness and the entropy is lower. Well, that's the way information systems evolve. That's the way consciousness as an information system evolves. And in a social system, the way you lower entropy is by caring about other people. Hmm. It's about cooperating. And in order to evolve, you need a situation in which you have choices that have consequences, that have meaning. You know, if you're all sitting around in a big chat room, there's no consequences. You can say anything to anybody at any time, and there's very few consequences to that. So you have a virtual reality like this one. Oh, there's life and death choices. There's lots of choices that have big consequences here. It's hard to find choices that don't have big consequences here. You know, the, everything has affects other people yeah. and has consequences. So this virtual reality is here as a schoolhouse for us to make choices and by those choices evolve the quality of our consciousness. And the system, I call the larger conscious system, it's evolving. And it had to do the same thing we're doing. It had to figure it all out too. Mm. And it figured it out. And now that's why it, gives people who have NDEs, near-death experiences, it gives them that little experience and sends them back to talk about it. That's uh, part of the solution because now, like I say, we have it all together. The last part is the high priests telling us that virtual reality is a mainstream idea, not a margin idea. Wow. And if we have enough people at that point who have a bigger picture and know that love and caring and cooperation is what life is about. That's our purpose here, to learn that. Well, when we realize that this is a virtual reality, that consciousness is the computer, you know, all that will fall together. Consciousness is, an, is, a, is a social system. Caring is what makes it evolve. So it all kind of, you know, it can all come together and we can take a big leap forward. Evolution goes like this. It starts out very low. I can get my hand up here on the camera. And it doesn't rise much. It just goes up a little. It just doesn't rise much. But then once it starts to learn, it can go up quickly. Yeah, That's the way evolution works. It's slow, slow, slow yeah, until slow. things actually start to change. And when they do, wow. You know, like a, cre a, a creature may be here for 100,000 years. And then when he starts going extinct between that starting and becoming extinct, it's generally fast. Yeah. It just, it just happens quickly. Evolution tends to have a curve like that. It accelerates toward whatever the pressures of its environment are, are pushing it. So here we are 200,000 years. We've been out of the trees walking, walking around as homo sapiens and 200,000 years, our social system have been warlord mentality, control, power, force. And that stayed the same right up until what? Five or 600 years ago? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe a thousand years ago, you know, well, a thousand years out of 200,000 is you know, half of 1%. So it's just been in very recent history that the growth has started this climb. We're starting to see some growth. And that just gets faster and faster and faster. And like I say, another decade, this will be mainstream. It'll be a virtual reality. If yeah. people understand that this virtual reality is here to help them evolve, to become love, then there'll be a movement. It'll go, yeah. you know, it'll go quickly. <clears throat> and humanity will take a great step forward and we will live in a kinder, gentler place. And all our institutions will begin to care about the people rather than care about their own power sure so when we when we reach that love when we, we reach that um, evolution 
and let's say we go on our consciousness transfers to the next reality like what happens next what is you know what is has been your experience like what is it you know do we go do we come back again do we or you know when we hit that certain x number of times that we want to come back where do we go next to evolve okay your evolution is never done okay what we're doing is reducing entropy it takes effort to reduce entropy the way entropy works called second law of thermodynamics if you just sit there and, and do nothing put no energy into it entropy increases it's just the nature of reality entropy increases same with consciousness evolution if you don't make an effort to grow up if you don't make an effort to get rid of your fear and your ego and your beliefs then nothing happens or you sink deeper you get worse you de-evolve okay so you can never get to zero entropy you never get to the point where there's nothing else to do you've grown as much as you can grow you never get there and if you did get there so you just kind of folded your arms and says oh i'm done that's when you'd start to de-evolve because you're no longer putting effort into it so you constantly have to be putting effort into it so what you'll do is that as you evolve and get a you know, a higher quality consciousness when you die you're going to come back to be helpful to other people who are still struggling with that fear and ego because you know i mean we've we've our quality of consciousness in humanity in general is pretty low <laughs> you know it's not you know we're not in this is not graduate school this is like daycare almost you know this is elementary school so if you do have some people who get up there and evolve then they'll come back because we need encouragement we need good examples you know we need people to explain the nature of reality and how it works so that's what you'll do and there's really no end in sight you don't graduate and, and get done it uh, it doesn't work like that you there's always somebody that needs help somebody that could use encouragement something even if you're nothing more than a good example you know that good example changes a lot of people you know think of the little old lady who lives on the corner street that stands out and you know talks to all the children after school when they walk home and hands out cookies and things like that you know and it's just nice i mean she doesn't give them money or anything is really going to change their life but she just smiles she's nice she's happy she calls them by name that makes a difference in somebody's life that's you know when when you share positiveness it helps everybody feel a little more positive so even just being a, a good example is a is a wonderful thing to be and we can always use more good examples you know if we had a whole lot more of those then we tend to act better we'd be more positive so there is no done the system itself is still evolving it's not done it's not supernatural it's not infinite it's not perfect it's an information system and it's conscious so it has lots of these individuated units of conscious they all have free will they form a social system and they have to learn how to cooperate and care and optimize lower that entropy because that's evolution is lowering the entropy so that's the thing you don't get to an end point you don't get done if you are if you have you know you run into somebody that has this attitude oh i am uh, i am fully evolved i'm enlightened i understand everything and i'm getting out of here because this hell hole just sucks and i'm out of here this is my last incarnation well does that sound to you somebody who really cares about other and wants to help or does that sound somebody nah, who sounds trapped? like he's going to degress right it sounds like somebody who's trapped in his own ego and he's thinking about himself and that is somebody who obviously is not that enlightened yeah. mm. tom man i i just i love hearing you talk i just love your theories i love your your the information the content that you're the value that you're giving my audience right now like it's just it's so cool to be connected with you um a man who has done a lot of research in quantum the quantum field and it's funny you're talking about science and the 
the overlords or the the high priests it's, it seems like through quantum physics it's like i found more spirituality through this and i have through religion it's crazy just thinking about all the the the, the theories um you know um just it's just it's bring brought me closer you know to experiencing that love to to making making sure that i show others love and 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 that's where i hope to go you know like this podcast is is my way of helping others grow and then bringing people like yourself who have done great work in this world scientific work that is kind of like you know it has crossed the line a little bit um with uh you know i wouldn't say religion but it's like science is helping show more love where it's not just science is trying to prove data or support data it's trying to help support your your science is trying to help others bring more love into their life and i think that's that's pretty yeah. cool yeah well what we're doing what you know what we need to do and what my you know what i'm trying to do and with my book is that we look at you know science and then we look at metaphysics religion philosophy and those two things seem to be almost opposed to each other there's like this big wall down the middle of them that uh you know science is generally very materialistic so they deny everything that happens you know that's not materialistic based sure. so they'll say remote viewing uh can't happen yeah they don't even have to look at it they don't have to test it they don't have to do anything because they know it is impossible because it's not materialistic and that's their belief so they're stuck in a belief trap. Well, scientists have a human like all the rest of us, and they have beliefs too that, that limit them. So the idea is to bring all that together. You know, once you understand that consciousness is fundamental, then you, when you understand consciousness, you can see how everything else fits in. You can derive physics. You can solve all these physics problems. You know, you can see how Bruce Lipton ends up with his attitude in epigenetics. Mm. You know, it's it's the mind that affects genetics. You can see how all this stuff fits together. And basically, it's all one thing then. It's not science over here and philosophy and religion and metaphysics over there. It's all one thing. And you see that the objective world is just a subset of a larger world. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's kind of silly for scientists to say, well, we only, you know, the objective world is the only world there is when what 75%, 80% of everything in our life that's really meaningful to us is subjective. You know, yeah. who are you going to marry? How many kids do you have? Uh, you know, what kind of job are you going to do? How do you treat other people? You know, what sort of relationships do you have? All those things are all very subjective. And that's what's really important in your life. You know, I heard somebody say that when you're on your deathbed, you don't regret that you didn't work more hours. <laughs> yeah. you, you regret that you didn't put more time, you know, into your relationships. That's where your regret, you know, if you're going to have any regret, that's where it's going to be. So it's in that subjective world is where most of the mean and most of the significance is. And yet science won't touch anything in there they yeah. walk you, away from that you can't replicate it it's not falsifiable or whatever they call it you know what i mean you can't yeah. prove them wrong they, i don't know it's just crazy um yeah well, well that's why that, i struggle that's with why the science have, that's why i struggle yeah, with science too that's a problem you know they have to see things in a bigger picture and they force even this what they call the soft sciences you know the hard sciences well those are the real sciences you know that's yeah. physics and biology and chemistry yes well they call the things like psychology and sociology and that stuff. They call it the soft sciences. Yeah, we're well, the steps. We're the step kid. The redheaded step yeah. kid. Psychology. So they don't. Yeah, you know, they don't take psychology, sociology, all that serious either. But the thing is that, unfortunately, to be a science, you have to be objective. So then you take sociology and psychology, medicine, other things that really mostly subjective, there's a lot of subjective things, and you throw out as much of the subjective stuff as possible and try to force it to be objective because that makes it science. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not real science. So now you have, you know, psychologists, you have soci you know, so sociology, sociologists, doctors, you have all these people that are in soft sciences, 
and they ignore all of the stuff that is not number-based. If they can't count it, if they can't measure it, then it's not worth doing. Yeah. And that's too bad because they're missing a whole lot of things that would be very helpful to people that just because they are forced to look at the object, only the objective side of things because that makes them science yeah. and they want to be taken seriously. So you have to be science. That's where the high priests are. You know, they want to be yeah. at least, you know, acolytes to the high priests. They, <laughs> they, they're trying very hard yeah. to be as objective as possible. So you have this big push in the soft sciences to be objective. And that leaves a lot of real interesting problems lying on the floor. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got parapsychology. All right. Well, those guys, have to be objective about something that is totally, totally. not objective. Totally not objective. I so mean, that's the, crazy. Yeah, so that limits them into what they can say and what they can't say. And if they stand up at a meeting and say things like, consciousness is fundamental and the you know the rest, everything else is a subset of consciousness, well, their credibility will go down, a, down the tubes. Yeah. Everybody yeah. will... Uh, X them off, you know, well, this guy's lost it, you know, he's not rational anymore. Yeah. Well, that happens to be a fact, but it'll never be a fact in a world that only looks at objective things, because that's all subjective. But see, the, the, the objective part of reality is just a subset of the larger reality, where the uncertainty is small. So that's you know, so the uncertainty is small, like, a, you know, you have a, that microphone in front of you, you know, what's the volume in that microphone? How tall is it? How, you know, what's its diameter? Well, none of those things can be said exactly because, you know, it depends on how many decimal places you can measure. Can you measure that out to 20 decimal places? Probably not. You know, you can, your equipment fails to be able to tell you what's in that 20th decimal place. So you have to guess out there. So none of it is entirely objective. It can't be defined objectively. But the uncertainty is very small. It's out in the 20th decimal place. So we say that's objective. The fact that we can't actually define it precisely, well, that's a problem only theoretically. But in the real world, we know what the objective world is. It's all the stuff that has small uncertainty. Yeah. The stuff that has large uncertainty is all the subjective stuff. There's lots of uncertainty. Should I take this job or that job? Ooh, lots of uncertainty. That's going to be a subjective decision. There's no way to objectively do that because there's not enough information. You see, so all the stuff that really matters to us uh, is subjective. Yet we, in all our sciences, even our soft sciences, our social sciences, we won't look at things unless we can measure them. So we try, they try but they have to do the numbers. They have to do the math and they have to do the statistics or they're not taken seriously. Yeah. Well, I'll take you seriously, man. You're, you're legit. I, I love having this conversation with you and I hate to end it. Um, we got to yeah, do this again we've, sometime. We've run over a little bit. Haven't we? <laughs> and it yeah. worries, man. Only for you though. That, that's, <laughs> that's the only thing only for you. Um, how can people reach out and connect with you? Well, they can go to the website, which is www.mybigtoe.com. They can go to the uh, people that organize all my events. That's where you find those, those uh, vinyl beats. And that's at uh, mbtevents.com. If they want books, I guess they can buy them at any place, usually buy books, bookstores and Amazon and so on. But if you don't want to buy them, they're free on Google Books. When I first published them in 2003, I put them out on Google Books and put the whole thing out there, and they've been free since the very beginning. I know where I'm going tonight. You, Google so, Books. <laughs> so they don't cost a whole lot. You know, my website, I do all three books for like uh, $25. So that's like, you know, eight bucks and change a piece. Good. So that's, that's awesome. yeah. So I don't charge a whole lot for them. But in any case, you can find books. Now, where you want to go, if you don't want to read these books, because these books are science, really, they are very logical. 
If you have a logical mind, then they'll be your thing. If you, you know, if you do, you know, process, logical process thinking, you'll love them. If you're not, if you're a right brain person that just does holistic thinking, you're going to struggle with these books because they're very logical. And in that case, go to YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel that has about a thousand hours of video. Really? That's very intimidating. Some of them are short, but most of them are pretty long. Mm -hmm. Every event I do, every talk I give, even every interview like this one, if I can get a hold of it, I put it up on YouTube. Everything I'll definitely that send I it can, to you. Yeah, send it to us, send it to MBT events, and uh, they will have it. They'll have it up on uh, my YouTube site, which is good for you too, because yeah. I've got like 50,000 subscribers and your video yeah. with your upfront data on it, you know, telling you who you are and the name of your show that gets 50,000 emails sent out for people to look at it. So yeah. it's, it's good for everybody. So I try to put everything out there, though some of my events are paid. You have to pay to go to them because there's venues and you know sure. food and other things. But I try to put them afterwards all out for free. Oh, so awesome. if you, I uh, told you about, I teach courses about how to, re, you know, remote view and do all these paranormal things. Well, go to go there and look for the the event I did at, at TMI, the Monroe Institute, and you will have the whole thing right there. You can do the whole course for free. That's awesome. And if you buy those binaural beats for $25, then when I tell all those people to go listen to the binaural beats, you can go listen to the binaural beats too. <laughs> and the only thing you're missing will be the ability to ask your own personal question. Sure. But most questions are pretty similar, you know, for people learning these things. And if mm -hmm. you just listen to the questions that are asked, they'll probably answer most of your questions. Yeah. You, I know uh, I'm on vacation just this week just to take some time off. And I know I'll be, uh, I'll be in the office for quite a bit, probably listening to those thousand hours of <laughs> content, uh, that rabbit hole you just opened up for me. Um, Tom, this has really been an honor. Like I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart for you coming on this show. Like this is, this is my passion. This is something that I'm very curious about. And for you taking the time, um, I know you're a bus very busy man. It really means a lot. And I say, thank you. Well, you're welcome. And I'll say thank you right back to you because my point is that when we, when we physicists get to the point of declaring this a virtual reality, the more people who have the bigger picture, the more quickly we'll end up at a kinder, gentler place. So that's uh, my, you know, one of my missions is to not keep this to myself, but to let people see the bigger picture. Because if you understand that bigger picture, all of that, all of the things that have been your experiences will all suddenly make sense and you'll know what to do next. You'll know if you're, if you're unhappy or if you're struggling or if you have trouble with relationships, all that stuff, you'll know what to do and you'll know how to do it. You know, it it's the difference between wandering around in the playing field clueless of what the game is and actually understanding the game and knowing how to win it. Sure. You know, those are two really different things. So the more people who figure out what the game is, that it's about caring, it's about love and so on, then that's good. And then I'm doing these, these experiments, which will go back up. They'll get published and be accepted by a physics journal. And that will start pushing a little harder on the scientists to look at it from this new viewpoint of virtual reality where consciousness is the computer. Hmm. So I'm trying to work both angles. And that's why I come here and talk to everybody pretty much who, you know, wants to talk is because that's how I can spread the word and let people know. I want to say thank you to Tom for joining the show. I want to say thank you to you, the listener, the audience for joining me today. Please leave a rating and a review wherever you get your podcast from. It helps me scale the show to those who may need, may need it the most. I want to say thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for hanging out. 2021 is going to be a beast. We're going to crush goals and find higher consciousness. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram at tdowns80. And uh, yeah, I have your superior self group over on Facebook. Check me out over there if you want or not. It's all good. 
But uh, I hope you guys have an amazing week and I will talk to you later.